بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So the lecture is titled The Middle Way and anyone who hears this title The Middle Way, The Middle Path you know immediately that it was taken from the Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah this is chapter 143 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى and we have made you a moderate ummah Wasat is in the middle, so an ummah that's in the middle. لتكون شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا. So that you will be witnesses over people, and for that the messenger will be a witness over you. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that He made our ummah a wasat ummah. So what does that mean? It means from a number of angles, we're middle. We take the middle path in everything. Our Sharia itself is not very strict and it's not very lax. The requirements of the deen themselves, not very strict and not very lax and so on and so forth. You see, for example, in Islam, with issues of aqidah, Islam is very strict with issues of aqidah, yani issues of belief. And you cannot have doubt in issues of belief. Someone can't say, I, I have, I'm not sure, and it is, is, uh, is God one or more than one? Is that acceptable? Not acceptable. I'm not sure if angels exist or not. Is that acceptable? Not acceptable because it's in the Quran, it's mentioned. So with issues of aqidah, the religion is very strict. Then when it comes to issues of fiqh, you find it's lax, there is room for argument, I mean, room for disagreement, room for different opinions, and this is, of course, how it was intended. Yani. But so, for example, someone can say, I'm not sure when I come up from ruku'ah, sami Allahu liman hamidah, do my hands go here, or do my hands go on this side? I'm really not sure about that. So one time I do this, one time I do that, just until I figure it out. Is that permissible, is that okay? Absolutely, it's okay with issues of fiqh. We can disagree with each other fiqh-wise. And it's not a reason for me to start another masjid across the street, is it? Because it's just fiqh opinion and people differ and companions differ on fiqh issues. But on aqidah, it's strict. So, we see then other verses that indicate to us that this must be a balanced religion. It must be a balanced religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu this is in Surah Al-Anbiya. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to humanity. So if he sent as a mercy, that also shows you that it's going to be lax, that it's going to be a middle path. Because if it's to this side, very strict, that's not very merciful. يعني. And if it's completely loose, that's not merciful either. Because as we'll see, inshallah, as we progress, a lot of problems happen when you don't have details or guidelines or restrictions. People think that if it's absolutely relaxed, and there are no guidelines and restrictions, it will be actually very good. It's not good, it's very bad for humanity as we'll see inshallah Azza wa Jal. We see from the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, again, they give us indication that we are a moderate ummah. And Nabi ﷺ said, Bashiru wa la tunaffiru. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. He said, Bashiru, give glad tidings. And don't, tunaffiru, yani to scare people away, send people away, turn people off. So give glad tidings, don't turn people off. وَيَسِّرُ وَلَا تُعَسِّرُ And make things easy, don't make things difficult. And of course the Prophet ﷺ, he's the one who came with this deen. He's the one who understands it best. And he described a deenu yusr wala usr. This deen, the religion is ease and not difficulty. He came with this religion, he knows it best. He said the religion is ease and not difficulty. So if you ever find the deen to be difficulty, that means either you, not, you don't understand it properly or you're not applying it properly. Because there's no way you can be sure this deen is difficult. While the one who brought it and knows it best said, it's easy. It's, it's not difficult. That means there's something wrong with our application or something wrong with our understanding if that's the case. And Nabi Wasallam also warned of our ummah of going to extremes and, and exaggerating and pushing it too much in the religion. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Iyyakum wal ghulu. Iyyakum wal ghulu. Ghulu يعني, is like overdoing it, pushing the boundaries, يعني, go, going overboard, going beyond what was required of you. فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ الْغُلُو What had destroyed the nations before you was الْغُلُو oh, Pushing it, going over the boundaries. This is like the story of the cow, we all know from Surah Al-Baqarah. Famous story, and it was a very simple incident. يعني, Musa alayhi salam says, إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَنْ تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً Allah commands you to slaughter a cow. خلاص يعني you know what a cow is go slaughter one لا what color is it what does it do 
Give us more details. All the cows look alike. All the cows look alike. Pick one. خلاص, Don't make things difficult. So in the end, Allah Azza wa says, in the, at the end when they slaughtered it, فَذَبَحُوهَا وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ they, they slaughtered it, but they almost couldn't do it. Because some of the, the, the Mufassirin explain in the end, with a certain color that was given to them, and the, the more they asked for descriptions, the more it was given to them. In the end, they found that exact cow with a young boy who loved it very much and didn't want to sell it. And they offered him the weight of that cow in gold. And some, some narrations say up to 10 times its weight in gold. You could have just picked any cow. You had to make things difficult. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what ruined the nations before you is pushing, pushing it like this, overdoing it and making things difficult. So Islam, we're going to argue inshallah that Islam is moderate in comparison to other religions. So, and then it calls for moderation within Islam itself. So these are the two things we're going to look at. And whenever we talk about Islam being moderate amongst other religions, the famous and the best probably comparison is to choose Judaism because of their strict laws and they're known for their laws being very strict. And the other one, the other extreme is Christianity. There is no fiqh, there no madahib even, there's nothing to, no, nothing, no details whatsoever, tahara, what have you, they don't have any of that. This is some of the examples and when you look at uh, Jewish law, you start to, to appreciate the Sharia and thank Allah Azza wa for the Sharia. And if any Muslim ever comes to you and says, oh, the Sharia is difficult and so many do's and don'ts, <laughs> that's not the case. Allah made our ummah moderate. We're between examples, Jews and Christians when it comes to jurisprudence and rulings and, and things like that. The Jews, for example, <coughs> very, very difficult, uh, very difficult Sharia. So for example, some of the things they have, you know, fruits and vegetables, they have to be examined carefully. Lettuce, broccoli, all these things, you have to examine them. Why? Because if there's a bug in it, the bug is not kosher. Taban, for us, we don't eat bugs as Muslims, right? But if you, if you crush one up with the lettuce, ya Allah, mash, mash shaha, like, I mean, what are you going to do, right? But they have to examine and inspect the vegetables like that. You cannot mix meat and dairy. Yeah, and you cannot eat meat and then drink milk, for example. Or if you're having you know, breakfast, you can't have milk with or cereal and then have like some kind of turkey or some kind of halal meat with it whatsoever, or sausage or anything like that. You can't mix meat and dairy. In some of their views, some of their fuqaha, they, you can't eat fish and, and meat either in one meal. And grape products made by non-Jews, haram. They cannot consume that either. See how things get difficult. With purification, it's difficult as well. Sometimes you can't even purify a garment except by cutting that part where there was najasa. For Muslims, you see, it's much easier, correct? And you have to just, you can wash it and remove the najasa, because najasa in Arabic, najasa is physical, so you remove the najasa from the clothing. What if a stain remains? So blood got on your clothing, let's say, and you washed it, and then there's some stain of blood. Is that an issue? It's not an issue because you remove the majority of it, and so on and so forth. So you see, a lot more relaxed there. If you look at the this laws of slaughtering, it's known as the Shkita law, Shkita. It is beyond strict, incredibly strict. After they slaughter every animal, then they have to run their finger or their nail against the knife like this. If in the slaughter process a small nick came on the blade, they have to change the knife, get another one immediately. For a Muslim, you can slaughter four or five animals if a nick came on the knife. Nothing happens, but there is very, very strict. And the, the sciatic nerve cannot be eaten, and all the adjoining blood vessels near, near that nerve can't be eaten. And so it has to be removed. Yeah? And sometimes it's a difficult process and not cost effective. So a lot of Jewish slaughterhouses just take that part and sell it to another non-kosher butcher because it's too much work for them. Uh, the fat around vital organs and the fat around the liver cannot be used for cooking for anything. It has to be, get, you throw it, get rid of it. For us, you know, you know the fat is the good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> um, they have to separate utensils. So the pots, pans, dishes that were used for, let's say, يعني, meat can't be used for dairy later. Why? Because they say the pot or the utensil will pick up the status. It will pick up the status of, uh, and if I put meat, kosher meat on it, then it, the plate now has picked up the status of kosher meat and I can't put any dairy product, cheese or anything on it later on. If I cut cheese with a knife, you can't use it later on for meat and so on until you go through another process. That makes going to restaurants 
difficult. And it's not, alhamdulillah, not the case for us because we're always at the restaurants, right? So that makes going to restaurants difficult. It makes uh, using dishwashers difficult. You can't because everything's mixing now. You got the kosher plate for meat with the plate for, for <laughs> milk in the same dishwasher. You can't do it like that. Stove tops, where you cook, can catch and take the status of kosher uh, as well. So now you have to you know, go through that process to make that any halalify that somehow, yeah? And so on and so forth. Working on the Sabbath, isn't that difficult? And we don't work on Al-Jum'ah, but we don't work during the time of Al-Jum'ah, right? Then you can open your store or restaurant after the Salah. If you open in the early morning before the Salah, it's okay. We're not prohibited. It's a day of rest for us, but we're not prohibited. For them, it's prohibited. Very difficult. It's so difficult that they, their history is they try to find ways around it, as you remember. And in America, in some cities, they would just say, you can, you know, the, the rule of law of the Sabbath is that you, can, you cannot work on the Saturday, the Sabbath. But in your home, you can work. So one city, they did, they took a big string and they put it around the neighborhood. And they said, this is all our home. You see? Just like with the fishing incident, yeah? In the Quran. Uh, for the woman, not allowed to touch the woman during her menses. Yani, touch. Like this. You cannot touch the woman during her menses. And that's difficult. And she's impure. She doesn't sit on your bed. You don't come near her. She doesn't come near you for the whole period of the menses. But of course, in Islam, much different than that. The Prophet ﷺ, and as narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, he would do a number of things to show us that that's not the case. In one incident, Aisha radiallahu anha drank from a container or like a you know what would like a cup or whatever container, and then she gave the Prophet ﷺ. Then what happened? He turned it to where she drank from. If you, this is a lecture about romance, we would mention this as a romantic thing. If it's a lecture about fiqh, we mention it because the Prophet ﷺ drank from there to show that she's not impure during the menses. Leave the romance aside. That's, what, that's the benefit of that incident. Not just because you drank from there, yeah? <laughs> but then you can use you the hadith based on the lecture, yeah? <laughs> but, uh, then the Aisha describes the Prophet ﷺ kana يعني يباشر and basically, the, the, the woman, the, his wife, or one of his wives, as Aisha narrates, would, would like cover and, and have a garment on and from the waist below. She would have a garment on. And then the Prophet and it would be very normal with her and, and can enjoy, enjoy any part of the body beyond that. And why would the Prophet do that? Some of the wisdoms the scholars mention, one of the wisdoms behind that is to show the woman that that's not all you're about. When you're in the menses, stay away, don't touch, don't come near the bed. It's just like how we treat the dog in Islam. How do we treat the dog in Islam? You don't want the dog on your bed, do you? Bring a dog into a Muslim home, we have a big problem. Right? Don't, you don't want the dog near you, you don't want the dog licking you, you don't want the dog on your, in, touching your utensils, true or false? So realistically, she has come to, like, close to that status now. But the Prophet ﷺ, when he is now being يعني, like this with, يعني, they can be caressing and touching any part of the body, anything that's not belly button to the knees, during the menses shows you that يعني, خلاص, يعني, you, you can still touch your wife and she's not, again, like we say, like a dog or something like that. And we're using the dog as a comparison because that's something in Islam we never want to touch. Yeah? We're not using the pig because we don't see those. Yeah? But in the street, you know, someone walks their dog and they think for some reason you want to touch the dog and they let it come near you. And they only knew what you want to do to the dog, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, what are some of the dietary laws and restrictions in Christianity? What restrictions, right? <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> No restrictions whatsoever, no laws whatsoever. And even all the, the, the dietary laws that came in the book of Deuteronomy, they cancelled it. So none of it makes you impure and you can eat what you want to eat and so on and so forth. And that's why when you watch those shows, the guy will just eat anything. Those, those shows where the guy travels around the world and eats things, he'll just eat anything. Now if you make a show like that, okay, with a Hanafi Muslim, where are they going to go? <laughs> There's just nowhere they can go. You know, every study that goes, just the you know, oh, khalas, we can't do it. <laughs> or any other Muslim, of course, I'm just... Fa so we see then, when you compare Islam to other religions, you clearly see we're in the middle path. Is Islamic law, dietary law, or any other law, anywhere near as strict as Jewish law? Absolutely not. 
anywhere near as flexible as, well, actually non-existent as Christian law? Absolutely not. So in that regard, you can clearly see how we're in the middle. And when you get to see that, you start to see what a blessing it is to be in the middle. Because both ways, I mean, one is too difficult, and one is really astray. When you have no restrictions, you're astray. I want to give an example to show what a blessing it is to have details. I mean, you know, sometimes people, they don't like the fact that there are details in Islam. I and mean, sometimes you, need, you meet these Muslims, and they're like, yeah, why does Islam interfere, if they, if they use that word, right? Why does Islam interfere in, in you know, little things? What we do with facial hair, women removing, plucking eyebrows. Why does Allah I mean, go into these things? First of all, because our bodies belong to Allah, Azzawajal, He can tell us what to do with them. And He can tell us what He likes. And as the slave, you have to do what your Lord says. You don't have a choice. As a slave, you do what Allah says. But when you recognize, when you, when you look at the details carefully, you see that details are a blessing. I'll give you an example. Let's just pick one thing. All right. Let's just pick uh, warfare. Because a lot of early Christians, when they looked at Islam, they saw Islam has guidelines for war. You know, the do's and don'ts in battle. Battle is mentioned in the Quran and everything. They said, you know, that, that means these people just love war. That's all. These are people who love war. Because we, we have our teaching, which from Jesus, it says, turn the other cheek. Yeah? But these people, they have even rules for war. Jesus didn't give us any rules for war. You see, from their, their argument is making it as if they have the upper hand here. And that because we have details, we're the ones who love war. It's actually exactly not that. Because we have details, our soldiers have restraint. Our soldiers, uh, yani Muslim soldiers, I'm not talking about any army today, I'm talking about in the good old days. Muslim soldiers, they had the best conduct, the best conduct of any soldiers in human history. Have you ever heard of any narration where a Muslim soldier raped a woman, for example? Impossible. Or even cut a tree. Because we have the guidelines that say don't cut trees. Don't attack a slave or a woman or a child or someone who's just carrying the drums or the water or something like that or a non-combatant. We don't burn crops or cut trees or kill animals. Even if, it, yes, these animals will feed and give milk to the enemy, we don't kill them. So you see the way of, of the believers, because they had guidelines, they had restraint and they had exactly a clear boundary line that they did not cross. When you don't have a boundary line and you have an unrealistic teaching such as turn the other cheek, what do you have? And basically you have fairy tales. Yani. And that's why if you look at it historically, uh, Christian soldiers were of the most brutal. And until today, I, 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 this is again, this is my personal opinion, my views and ex opinions. So and if anyone's worried, you can distance yourself from what I'm saying. But uh, until today, the most violent, and even in recent history, the most violent soldiers have always been yani, the Christians. And they've killed more people than any other group on earth today. That's a historical fact. But why? How could the people who follow the Prophet of Peace, who says, turn the other cheek, be <laughs> killing more people than anyone else? Does that make sense? It's wrong, isn't it? But why then? You analyze why, and you come back to one thing. They didn't get enough details. So all they got was an unrealistic teaching, and no society can live like that. Our ummah has details, and the details made us moderate. Do you see this point? Okay, no one's amazed by that point. I love that point. <laughs> it's a wonderful point. Our ummah has details, and because of the details, we can be moderate. Their ummah didn't have any details, so they became violent. Even though the teaching is, is peaceful, but society can't live like that. Turn the other cheek. What happens, Yanni? So someone, a thief now comes into your house, your wife sees him, he slaps her. What do you tell her? Honey, turn the other cheek, yeah? <laughs> or maybe you have a second wife. You, you, come here, let him slap you also. <laughs> It can't work like that. So they didn't have any laws for murder. Yani they didn't know how to deal with the murderer, the thief, the, any kind of transgressor, oppressor. What do you do with him? Just turn the, you can't keep turning cheeks. How many cheeks are we going to keep turning here? In the end, what happens? So they had to come up with their own laws on for yani criminal law, basically. And uh, St. Augustine was of the first who started to write laws for the Christians because they didn't have anything except turn the other cheek. Now you move to Islam and Nabi Sallallahu said, Ana Nabiyyul Rahma wa Nabiyyul Malhama. I am the Prophet of Rahma and the Prophet of Malhama. Malhama, Malahim, battles. 
You see the root lahm. Lahm is meat. In these battles, there would be meat on the ground at the end. Arms cut off, parts cut off. So why does he say that? Out of love of battle? It's clear from his sirah he didn't love battle. So he didn't say it out of love of battle. He said it meaning battle here يعني, in the place of the sword meaning the you know a capital punishment if need be how to deal with you know the rapist if need be the adulterer if need be there has to be a law and no society can function without the use of law or the sword really and when the christians realized that they started to write their own law and because they wrote their own law you have all the brutality that used to occur in europe and so on but we didn't write our own law Allah Azza wa and the Nabi Sallallahu gave us our law and that's why it was always moderate and fair and we didn't have brutality in our history. And you guys here, when the other day we walked by this, uh, what's, that, what's that museum called where there's all the torture? Ne next to it, next to the aquarium, next to the London Eye. Uh, London Dungeons. Uh, something, London Dungeons, uh, like you, uh, no, not mean you now, the Muslim, you British, but Okay, we're attacking the British side of you, huh? <laughs> not the Muslim side. So you guys had uh, and such a history of murder and torture, and now you have museums to show, uh, this is the history of torture we used to have and stuff like that. <laughs> severe, severe stuff. Why? Because they didn't have guidelines. They just had this unrealistic thing, turn the other cheek. You see the difference now, what we're saying. That's why it's such a blessing to have details in the deen. Such a blessing to have the how and the, and the why in our religion. And those who don't have it, they went overboard because of not having it. Tayyip, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now within Islam, so now we've discussed Islam when it, in comparison to other religions, we saw it clearly being the moderate path. Within Islam, we have texts that always call to moderation. And the Quran itself, anytime it mentions something, so, sometimes it'll mention something in a bad light, then it'll mention the same thing in a positive light. What happens when you put the two together? You get something in the middle. Yeah. And that's why it's not honest يعني, if a Muslim wants to take all the evidence that's against something in the Quran and just list you the ayat without listing the other ayat that are talking about it in a positive light. And we're going to take some examples inshallah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Halaka al mutanatti'oon, halaka al mutanatti'oon, halaka al mutanatti'oon. Three times. He said, The extremists are destroyed. The extremists are destroyed. The extremists are destroyed. Type the question is, Who are the extremists? Who is extreme? And the word extreme now, we just throw it around. Yani Non-Muslim doesn't like a Muslim, they're extreme Muslims. The government doesn't like a specific group, they're extreme Muslims. Muslims don't like the masjid across the street, they're extremists. Everyone is, who's not how do we know who's extreme and who's not extreme? The scholars say, within any realm, within any belief system, for the most part in the religion, you will find for the most part two extreme ends. An extreme end over here and an extreme end over here. Within Islam, we have the same situation. We have this type of extremist, and most people don't recognize this, but we have another type of extremist as well. So the one that goes overboard and the one that has nothing to do with the deen, that's an extremist, isn't it? No? Yeah? Yes. They went to another extreme. Many times people think there's one, so if you have a family, if there's a family, let's say not very practicing, then they have two boys, two sons. One starts to practice and go to the masjid and grow his beard and shorten his clothes, and the other one is, you know, going to the clubs and everything. Which one gets the message, the, the, the lecture about don't become extreme, my son? Which one? The one that's getting religious, right? The other one now, girlfriends and clubs and drinking. Is that extreme or not? It's beyond extreme. He never gets the lecture. Because people don't understand that there are two extremes. But if there are two extremes within a, a religion or an ideology or a belief system or what have you, there's always got to be a middle then. And in Islam, the middle is, it's a person. That's the hint. Who is the middle? The Prophet ﷺ. No doubt, correct? No believer ever would say, no, he was towards this extreme or the other extreme. And Nabi ﷺ was the middle. He was the middle. He was not towards either extreme. So this is now our measuring st stick for what is extreme and what is not extreme. We look at this chart here and we look at whatever the incident that is being accused of being extreme. Did the Prophet ﷺ do it or not? If he did it, that means it's moderate. It's not extreme. If he didn't do it, I mean, you're either going beyond what he did, you're moving towards this extreme. And you're really neglecting what he's taught, you're moving towards the other extreme. And that's just how it is. So, for example, <coughs> at one time there, was, uh, there were these interns that came to an Islamic organization and everything. They helped out for the summer. And then at the end when they're leaving in their final speech, they said, you guys are very extreme. <laughs> you don't shake hands with women. Is this extreme? 
Let's go back to our chart. The Prophet ﷺ, did he sh shake hands with women? He didn't. So that means if you don't shake hands with women, you're being moderate. And of course, people might ask, what, what is an example of going be beyond the extreme? We'll get to that example. <coughs> there was, by the way, uh, a very nice yani, incident. Well, I don't know if it, it wasn't nice in and of itself, yani, but the teaching was nice. During the Battle of Hunayn, 12,000 companions went out with the Prophet ﷺ. And the mushrikun brought with them the women and children. And they even put them in the, in the front lines as well, in the battle. So, any, you understand the tactic behind that. The women, the Muslims wouldn't want to attack women and children. And so, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then after, when the battle was over, he found a woman that was killed. A woman that was killed. And could you argue that most likely she was probably killed by accident? Don't you think? Do you think one of the companions would want to kill a woman? If, uh, yani if, if Abu Dujana stopped his sword in mid-blow over the head of Hind bin Udba because he didn't want to kill a woman with the sword of the Prophet ﷺ, don't you think that the companions wouldn't want to kill a woman? So you can argue, yes, it was an accident and so on. The Prophet ﷺ could have also said, it's their fault. They brought the women and children out and put them in the, in the front lines. It's not my fault. But no, the Prophet ﷺ was angered. He was angered. He said, Wallahi ma kanat hadihi tuqatil. He said, Wallahi, she, this was not, yani this woman here, was not a, a warrior, one of those, those who was fighting. So why is she killed is basically what he's saying. If she's not a fighter, why was she killed? And you see that, and this is going back to our first argument, but I, I like this point, I wanted to mention it. Going back to our first argument of having guidelines. And there were no excuses made here. Yeah? And most likely she was killed by accident, but the Prophet was angered. Because this is a respectable army. Do not injure women or children, anything like that. And I think I must also add this uh, incident of uh, during the Battle of Al Qadisiyah when the Muslims were facing the Persians. So Rustum is the leader of the Persian army and he comes and he settles in a village, a Persian village. So the next day, the battle, or whenever the battle comes, for now we're settling with a village of, of Persians here. The Muslims on the other side camped in a Persian village as well. So at night, then the leaders of the Persian village, they came, the, the leaders, the big shots, you know, the, old, the elderly, the wise men, the nobles, they came to Rustum and they complained. They said, your soldiers now, they're attacking uh, the village, they're attacking the women, they're taking people's possessions, they're just by force, they're getting drunk and they're wreaking havoc in the city. So they're complaining to him, please contain your soldiers, they're harming our people. And Rustum, it is narrated that Rustum said, these Muslims, they deserve to become victorious over us. Because we're camped with our own people and look how we're dealing with them with injustice. And look how we're, we're handling them. And they're camped with a people that they don't know, that they're not their people. And they treat them so well. So they deserve to defeat us. So what does that show you? It shows you the conduct. Very high level of conduct from the Muslim soldiers. And today, of course, yani, you look at soldiers uh, worldwide. Yani, and you look, if, if I'll pick on the American soldiers, that what they were doing in Iraq. And then when, when the news would come, some people had the, uh, need the nerve to be surprised. Oh, our men and women did that? Our boys did that? Yes, your boys did that. What were your boys taught in, in boot camp? Tajweed and stuff? <laughs> they were trained and told that they were killers all the time. And they're trained to kill and want to kill. And they're told by the drill sergeant, you're killing machines. And they're using the worst kind of yani, words to, to fill in their mind that they're killing machines. And then you're surprised when they kill a family and stuff. Well, why? Well, anyway, they're muttaqeen and they're doing you know, qiyam all the time. That's why it's very, be, yani, not you cannot fathom why they killed the family. So this is the history of the Muslim soldier in Islam. And part of that was the... The, the details and the conduct, code of conduct that we had versus those nations that don't have it. So I know we went back to uh, that argument. Moving back to what we were saying today, we're talking about now the extremists. We're talking about how the moderate and the middle is the Prophet Sallallahu We have this extreme end and we have that extreme end. And the Prophet said the extremists are destroyed. So... With, even with issues of belief, we're in the middle. And we've had sects and groups in Islam that were at one end or the other. We have the Khawarij and the Murja'ah. The Khawarij are those people who see that if you commit a major sin, you're a non-Muslim. You're, you're a Kafir now if you commit a major sin. 
طيب what about توبة؟ لا you have to take the shahada all over again and we had the murji'a the murji'a say that iman does not decrease and no sin affects the iman and all that and both are wrong and the middle is that we can you have tawbah with the concept of tawbah in islam the khawarij if you commit a major sin you're a non-muslim one of the this is a true story there was uh, one of the one of the khawarij i'm not going to mention the country but he would be standing around with shabab they're just talking and stuff then suddenly he's like Brothers, brothers, I just became a kafir. Then he'll go, he'll say the shahada, he'll wash, he'll come back dripping wet. They're chit-chatting and everything. Then brothers, I just became a kafir. He goes again, washes again, comes back, and again, he's sitting, brothers, brothers, I just became kafir. And he, why? Because they believe you commit a major sin, you're, uh, you become a non-Muslim. And he'll get a bad thought, or a kufri thought, for example. And just on that thought, I've become a kafir. They told me you're going to catch a cold this way. And you're, you're wet all day and stuff. This is what he believed. This is the way of the khawarij. The murja at the other extreme. The middle path. You commit a major sin. You can make tawbah. And Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah will forgive. Even shirk and it can be forgiven as long as you repent before you die. In the sincere repentance, you stop doing what you're doing. You have the resolve to not go back to it. And you, you feel bad for doing it. That's it, خلاص. And no one can come between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. So even with issues of belief, we have the ingredients for being in the middle. And when people ignore some of the evidence and take part of the evidence, they go to one extreme or the other extreme. With acts of worship as well. With acts of worship, we have a tremendous amount of detail that keeps it right in the middle. So it doesn't, we don't push ourselves overboard and get bored and tired or the act of worship becomes a chore. Right? Like for example, even when reading the Qur'an, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, he used to say, read the surah, and he said, go over its meanings. It's like, kind of like saying, enjoy it. And then he says something interesting. He said, do not let the concern of one of you be the end of the surah. Do you know what that means? Don't let your concern be the end of the surah. Someone will say, I want to read Al-Baqarah. It's Saturday morning, I'm going to read all of Al-Baqarah today. So what happens? They put a marker towards the end of Al-Baqarah. And they keep reading, reading, reading. Then every now and then they stop and they find, they go back and see, okay, how, how thick they, they stick, okay. Yeah? Then they read, 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 read. Then they, again they grab the pages. How, th how many pages? They count them. So the concern is what now? The end of the surah. I want to read the juzu. And every now and then they put, they see the marker. Where's the juzu? Okay, juzu, almost. Type. Uh, go back to reading. Is your concern now the ayat, the meanings, the message? Yeah, just when, when is this going to be over with, right? And as one of the mashaykh said, he said, yeah, some people, the salah is over, it's like they're in prison. <laughs> Get up, khalas. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa khalas. Like, I just, like you were in prison, they just opened the door, they said, Fadl, you can walk out now. And they just run out. He said, yeah, just sit, sit, make dua, make the adkar, finish that, you know? So with worship, we have the, what the scholars have termed the three pillars of worship, which is the love, hope, and fear. And the hope and fear are so essential to keep you balanced. Because too much hope, not good. Too much fear, then you lose hope and you give up. You do one sin, khalas, Allah will never forgive me. That's the end of that. But when you have that, this balance, you have these details, you can stay moderate. You know, having too much hope, you become, again, like the Christians. Very, too much hope. And there's some, I mean, when you meet Christians and you talk to them, they're sure that they're going to Jannah. They're, like, they're very sure. There's no even doubt about it. And one coworker, she was telling me, she said, she said, when I die, I will go to the gates of paradise and they will open those doors for me. <laughs> Who are you exactly? <laughs> this other guy, one time, he's telling me, so in Islam, he's a Christian again, so in Islam, you guys, you're not sure if you're going to paradise? Well, I was very surprised at this concept. I said, and who's sure if they're going to paradise? He did this. <laughs> you sure? If you're sure, that, wouldn't that be bad for you? <coughs> Brothers, wallahi, let's be honest with each other. If you were sure today you're going to Jannah, wouldn't that be bad for you? For me, I'll, tell, I'll be honest with you. If, if that was me, I'll, it'd be very bad for me. It'd be very bad for me if Allah told me I'm going to Jannah. I'll walk in here, Imam is saying, Stawu. I'll just push him aside. I'll be like, move. <laughs> Any of you in here giving glad tidings to paradise? So I'm going to lead the salah. Stawu. I'll be very arrogant, yeah? 
Imam is giving the khutbah and the member will pull him down. What do you know about Jannah? Get out of here. <laughs> Inna alhamdulillah. Who else should give a khutbah? But you know something? Doesn't that really show you how tremendously magnificent people the companions were? Wallahi, they're magnificent people. A man would be given glad tidings of paradise more than once and he's a normal person crying out of fear of Allah still. What does that tell you about them? Huh? Magnificent people. If you tell me I'm going to Jannah, why am I going to cry? I'll be laughing all the time. <laughs> tell me ayat about Jahannam, I'll be like, I'm not going there. <laughs> Those people who are going there, we didn't care. But that shows you how magnificent they were. Anyways, the point is hope and fear. And the love is what drives you, right? To worship Allah. But the hope and fear, keep it balanced. And some scholars have even likened it to a bird. With the hope and, and the fear being the two wings that keep that bird balanced. And if one of these wings breaks, what happens? It won't work. So with worship and with the Prophet we have, يعني, he's, to, he's to show people what level, and, and, and how far they can push the worship, if I can use that term. So for example, uh, there's a narration about Mu'adh bin Jabal, عنه, and he used to pray with the Prophet and then he would go to another people, another area, and lead them in the Salah. And he used to enjoy and love the Salah, so he would pray long. So he would pray Isha with all of Al-Baqarah, for example. يعني, okay, if you, يعني, you look at Al-Baqarah, how many days do we break Al-Baqarah in our Taraweeh? Yeah? And everyone's like, yeah. yeah? So now this is this Isha, all of Al-Baqarah. So one of the one time he, and he used to make the Salah long because he would enjoy it. So one day, one of the people was praying behind him and the Salah was long. So he left the Salah, prayed by himself. And طبعاً, they're still praying. And goes to the Prophet Sallallahu and he compa complains about Mu'adh. So when the Prophet meets Mu'adh, he's angered with him. And he tells him, أَفَتَّانٌ أَنْتَ يَا مُعَادٌ أَفَتَّانٌ أَنْتَ يَا مُعَادٌ You know, someone who creates a fitna, someone who will test people, someone who will wear people down, wear their patience down, you're testing them like that. Are you this type of person, ya Mu'adh? And he instructed them to make it short. Yeah. So, mercy and balance, always. And we know, for example, this, the hadith of Hamdallah, very famous, Hamdallah the companion, when he met Abu Bakr, and he tells him, Nafaqa Hamdallah, Hamdallah has become a hypocrite. He has done hypocrisy. Why? Because when we're with the Prophet ﷺ, our imaniyat are really, really high. He tells us about Al-Jannah and Al-Nar, as if we can see them. Then we go home, then it's money, and children, and dunya, and food, and all kinds of other things, and iman decreases. So he thought this up and down was hypocrisy. And Alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ explained to us that's not the case. Otherwise, we would have fallen into that thought as well. So he tells him, it's impossible for you to stay at this level all the time. And if you stay at that level, the angels will come and shake your hands and walk with you in the streets. It will be impossible. You'll be like an angel now. Walakin, he tells him, Sa'a, يعني an hour and an hour. يعني sometimes like this and sometimes like that. Taban, Sa'a isn't necessarily an hour, it means like moments. Yeah. So a moment like this and a moment like that. So there means there's, that means there's fluctuation. We know the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. By the way, who's the timekeeper? I need the, a 10 and a 5. Is that you? Okay. Just, I don't want to, and uh, so I can wrap it up properly. Who's our timekeeper? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that long. It's not like I have any, you know. I'm almost done anyway, so. Zakallah um, The Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he got married to, uh, to a woman, and when his father came and he, to check, so he asked her, how is he? And she basically explained to him in so many words that he nev never comes near me. Why? Because he's fasting all day and he prays the whole night, the entire night. Yeah? And subhanAllah, yani, now someone gets married, what do you say? So brother's very active in the masjid. You know, very active. He's always in the front row, always helping out, putting things up, getting things set. Biryani, he's passing out the rice and giving plates and everything. If dinners, every, he's helping in the When he gets married, what, is, what happens? Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. He was a wonderful brother, Wallah, he, he will be missed. Like his janazah now here. <laughs> you know? Why? Because khalas, he's gone now, he disappears. This is the opposite here. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he was the opposite. He gets married and instead of you know, being lost in that, he never comes near her. So he's taken then to the Prophet Sallam, and now we start to see a negotiation happening. They're negotiating acts of worship. 
So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, how do you pray? He says, I pray the whole night. How do you fast? He says, I fast every single day. Then the Prophet ﷺ starts to negotiate with him. They were going to start a new, give a new number here, agree on a different number here. But he starts low, sallallahu alayhi wa He tells him, so he fasts every single day. The Prophet ﷺ says, fast three days a month. How do you go from every single day to three days a month? But the Prophet ﷺ is starting low. He said, fast three days a month. He said, I can do more than that. He said, he said fast two days a week. He said, I can do more than that. He said, then do the best fast. The most beloved fast to Allah is the fast of Nabiullah Dawood. He used to fast a day and a break fast the next day. So every other day. So they agreed on that. Which is half of what he used to do anyways, right? He used to do every single day. Now we've got every other day. Then he said, how do you pray at night? He said, I pray the entire night. And then he tells him, yani finish the Quran once a month. We use the Quran in prayer once a month. He says, I can do more than that. He said, then once every 10 days. He says, I can do more than that. He says, then once every three days. And that's the deal that they agreed upon. But what's really amazing is that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he later on, he, he becomes an old man. And he says, I wish I would have taken the advice of the Prophet Because now it became difficult for him as an old man. Taib, can he stop? Can he decrease? Is it permissible? This is all يعني, voluntary anyways, right? So he can change, he can st completely stop if he wants to. But he said, I don't want to change it or stop it because this was a deal I made with the Prophet ﷺ. He looked at it like a deal and an arrangement he made with the Nabi ﷺ and now he's, he's gone. He's not here to, to renegotiate it. So I'm going to stick and stay upon that. Yeah. So we see... And we see the Prophet ﷺ bringing people to be moderate. Because in the hadith also, in the narration, he tells them, if you do that, your eye will get tired. وَنَفِحَتْ نَفْسُكْ يعني You will get bored even. نَفِحَتْ يعني get bored. See the wording? So you will get bored of that. It'll get, it's too much for you. Yeah, maybe you've got energy now, so after a while you have to keep this consistent. So he decreased it because of that. Moderation again. Or the other narration is very famous of the companions. Some of them, they went and asked the wives of the Prophet ﷺ about the worship of the Prophet ﷺ. And they didn't, I mean, they were expecting it to be like severe, like incredible amounts of worship, never stop fasting and all that. But the Prophet ﷺ always gave a variety in his acts of worship. So sometimes he would fast and they would, their narration says, we thought that he would never stop fasting. Sometimes he would not fast for a while. We think he's never going to fast. Sometimes it's Monday and Thursday. Sometimes it's the the the, the ayam al bid of the month and on so on and so forth. He gave a variety so we can, based on our ability, also to pick from these sunan and do what we can as well, to not to overburden us. So here, these companions, when they found this variety and they found the description not as severe as they wanted it or thought it would be, they said, "Well, that's the Prophet ﷺ. He's been forgiven for his past and future sins." But we are not. So one of them said, I will fast and never stop fasting. The other said, I will pray and never sleep. And one of them said, what's the third one? That يعني, I will not, I'm not going to marry women. And of course, the one that offends us the most, he said, I'm not going to eat meat. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> we love our meat, don't we? <laughs> so, so what happens? The Prophet goes to them. And he tells them that يعني, I'm the best amongst you. And I'm the Prophet of Allah. And I marry women, and I pray and I sleep, and I fast and I break fast, and I eat meat in the other narration. So he's now, he didn't tell them stop what you're doing, but he's bringing them back to the middle. His way is the middle. That's why he brought them back to his way. And that's why he mentioned his way. Yeah. People now, they, when, if someone's doing an act of worship, they try to stop him. Don't stop, but just bring it back to the middle. Don't tell me khalas sleep and don't do that. No, just dig, yani bring it to the middle, to the way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is also what is yani apparent from the Quran. Allah mentions sleeping and getting up to pray, right? Allah azza wa jalla says, "Tatajafa junubuhum an al madajj yadruna rabbahum khawfan wa tamaan ila akhir al ayah." Tatajafa junubuhum an al madajj, al madajj, the places of laying down, so or, or lying down. So they would be lying down and then they would get up to pray which is يعني, apparent from the meaning of the ayah in the Qur'an. Okay, in dunya, moderation as well. And you see the hadith, you put them together and you see a nice balance. So when it comes to the dunya, when it comes to materialism, it comes to clothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith, the Nabi said that Allah loves to see 
the effect of his ni'ma athar ni'matahu the, uh, the, uh, the effect of his ni'ma on his servant so Allah makes you rich he wants to see the effects of that he wants you to, to have a nice place a nice car nice clothing this is the effect of the ni'ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you but at the same time we have other texts so we don't go overboard and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says whoever wears a garment for fame or for showing off Allah azza wa will dress him with a garment of humility yani humiliation basically why? <coughs> to keep it balanced. And just to keep it balanced, again, the famous hadith, Inna Allah la yandur ila suwarikum. Allah does not look at your appearances, your external appearances, but He looks at qulubikum wa a'malikum. He looks at your hearts and your deeds. So we have all these texts, you put it together and you come up with something very, very moderate. It's true, yani Allah doesn't get, if this person is not wearing designer clothing or he's poor and there's holes in his clothing, he's not judged by that, walhamdulillah. He's judged by his actions and what's in the heart. Someone else can be dressed in the best clothing and very bad in here and very bad in actions. So you tell me he's going to Jannah because of his clothes? No. So it keeps us moderate. These kinds of texts keep us moderate. With that, I would like to give some advice to the shabab, to the young men yani, uh, in the audience or the young men listening. Do not overdress religiously. Okay? You never find any of the scholars of this. And actually most of the scholars will tell the young men, don't do that. Like a young man, he'll wear like this khutra, and he'll wear like a bisht and stuff, walk around. Who are you, young man? Who are you? You're like 20 or something. You walk around like you're mufti diyar and stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not proper, and it's not, I mean, it can be, some scholars say it can be libas al-shuhra. Libas al-shuhra is like the garment for showing off. Don't do that. People overdress all the time, walking around the conference looking full sheikh outfit, you know. Just put your kufi on and just be sweet, and that's it. Walking around like you're the sheikh. And serious looks, the guy's like 21, he's like this. Are you like this all the time? Don't do that. I remember one time I gave this young, I told this young man, told me, he, he was wearing like, you know, the bisht, the cloak on top. And this the cloak is now a big level now. He's got a ghutra on, got a cloak on, on top of the throat, walking around the eight celebration. We'd get, you know, they wrap the cloak up like this. And he's walking around like this. I told him, and I knew him, so I pulled him aside and in a gentle way, inshallah. I told him, Yaqi, don't dress like this. It's overdressing and this is how the scholars dress. He looked at me, he said, the Prophet Sallam used to dress like this. Yeah, but who was the Prophet Sallam? He was the Imam, he was the leader, he was the, <laughs> the biggest, if you want <laughs> we can't call him a Shaykh, of course, Allah Sallam. But he was the most knowledgeable authority and the Imam and the leader. And who are you? So you see? So Anmahim, that's the advice to the youth. Uh, the ahadith of being in the dunya like a traveler. So not accessing. When you're a traveler, what happens? You only take what you need for the trip, true or false. If you're driving from here to London and you see a sign, you know, refrigerators for one pound, what can you do? Halfway between here and London, refrigerators for one pound. Would you stop? What are you going to do with it? Can you tie it on top of your car? And you know how small cars are in the UK? How are you going to tie a refrigerator? How can I tie a refrigerator on top of that? It's impossible. So what are you going to do with it? Nothing. You only need what you, you only take what you need for that journey. This hadith is pushing us away from accessing and little and too much being too attached to the dunya and wanting too much of the materialism. Yeah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells even with eating, Subhanallah, even with eating, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wakulu, washrabu, wala tusrifu, innahu la yahibul musrifin." Eat and drink and do not excess. Allah does not love those who excess. Notice, eat and drink and don't excess. And now how do people eat now? If you don't fill it all the way to the top, you're uncomfortable. Yeah? You ever see someone when they go to a place and they eat and then they still have like a space like this big? They like, they keep, look, where, what can I fill this with? Grape, give me something, just small grape. I've got an opening this big, let me. <laughs> then we can thank Allah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and now we're sleepy, right? But you know something? It's wonderful how when someone is like filling their stomach too much, someone says, Yeah, akhi, you know the hadith, right? Fill, you know, one third for your stomach, one third for your drink, one third for the air. And we mentioned this, like that's the minimum, right? And the minimum is you should put one third food, one third water, and then leave one third empty for breathing. That's the minimum. <laughs> that's the maximum in the hadith. People never quote the hadith in the beginning, right? In the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ma mala ibn Adam wa'a min batnih. The human being has never filled a vessel worse than his stomach. 
Then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hasbu ibn Adam luqaymatin yuqimna sulbah. Sufficient for the son of Adam are a few bites to sustain him. فَإِنْ كَانَ وَلَا بُدْ If you have to and there is no other way, then a third for the food, a third for the drink, a third for the air. That's the maximum. And we quote the hadith like it's the minimum. Brother, just fill a third. <laughs> fill a third for the... Experiment with this thing. Wallahi, these things are fun. Experiment with them. I experimented with the hadith of a few bites a day for a while. Needless to say, the experiment was a very short one. <laughs> okay? The way we eat now, Allahu Musta'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ Those who are wasteful, they're the brothers of the shayateen. Why? To, to deter us from being wasteful. So, going overboard in anything, in eating, in drinking, in just being wasteful in anything. Don't be wasteful in anything. Towels, ya akhi, paper towels, Allah, this is, alhamdulillah, a great opportunity to say this. I've been wanting to say this for years. When people, I see, uh, uh, and the Muslims, yeah, so someone will just wash their hand and then they'll like take like five towels. Yeah, how big are your hands in time? They just wash their hands like this, then like shuk, 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 shuk. Then he just goes like this and he throws them dry into the trash. But why waste all these towels? You know, if you use the towel very well, after wudu, you can just use two, three maximum. It's possible, but we're wasteful in a lot of things. So the deen is bringing us, making us moderate even in non-worship related activities. And of course, some of these activities will affect worship. Everyone who has eaten huge, huge iftar in Ramadan and went to Tarawih knows the difference between that day and the day when you ate very little and went to Tarawih. One time I went to a buffet and we ate a lot. Then we went to Maghrib prayer. Imam is reciting maybe Surah Al-Ikhlas. I'm like, Ya Allah, Ya Akhi. When is this Imam gonna end the Salah? <laughs> Surah Al-Ikhlas, man. Four verses, come on now. Make it shorter, <laughs> you know? You fill up, and that's why the early Muslims used to also say, just for, yani for fun purposes, al-bitna, what goes into the button, al-bitna, tudhhibu al-fitna. You're not smart anymore when you eat a lot, right? I think we've all experienced that. You eat a lot and someone tells, what's one plus one? Plus one? Al-Muhim. In charity, طيب, we're just gonna يعني, mention like three or four very quickly. In charity, moderation, everything, moderation in everything. In Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبْصُرْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا So do not make your hand like tied to your neck, meaning not giving in charity. And don't let it loose 100% either. And then you'll sit blameworthy and in severe poverty. Everything, there's a balance. Everything in the balance. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, the man who is giving away too much of his wealth, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, leave something for your children so they don't become ala يتكففون الناس. Ala, like a burden on the, the society. Now everyone needs to give them. يتكففون الكف is the hand. When you beg, you, you give the kaf to people. يتكففون الناس. So your children don't become like that either. A balance. With everything, with sexuality, there's a balance. And it not being restrictive where there's no way out, obviously there is with marriage, and not being loose. And you know, I don't have to go into loose, you Muslims are living in the West, you know very well what happens with a loose society, all the kinds of problems that happen in a loose society. Praising the Prophet and this is a great thing, and he is a great man, he even didn't want people to overpraise him. And when they came to him, the Arabs came to him and they overpraised him and they said, You are our Sayyid, our best, and the son of our best. He said, La tutruni, do not overpraise me, Kama Atrat al Nasar ibn Maryam, as the, the, the Christians overpraised the son of Mary. I am rather, I am a slave of Allah, يعني, or a servant of Allah, so say, Abdullah and his messenger. To stop them from overpraising, because as you all know, you overpraise, it's one of the steps to something being worshipped later on, right? The people of Nuh, where the first shirk and incident ever occurred, overpraising the righteous that used to live, in the end, after generations, they get to be worshipped. So the Prophet ﷺ stopped people from doing that. And in hating also, we don't go overboard. And you can hate something about someone and love him for something else, true or false? No, no, no love here. <laughs> And, and someone can have a non-Muslim non -Muslim parents and can he love them? Does, he, does that mean, astaghfirullah, you said he loves them. That means he loves their shirk as well? Who said that? 
He hates their shirk and he loves them, they're his parents. And sometimes we'll meet Muslims who will tell reverts, leave your parents, leave your mother. I, this happened right in front of me. Revert was here and this guy was here. And he was telling him, you live with your mother? No, leave her. She's a mushrika. <laughs> Where would you get this from? He can hate her shirk. He's not, like, he's not going to church with her. But it's his mother. He loves her. طيب, and we'll conclude by saying, being moderate is in following the sunnah of the Prophet And putting things in their proper place, you'll be moderate. And following this sunnah and the details of the sunnah help preserve this deen. Help preserve this deen. And the sunnah shows us how to pray. The sunnah shows us how to take the percentage out for zakah. So in following the sunnah, we're able to preserve the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by putting things in their place, a lot of times people, they just want to, to take something and put it out of context. Or they don't, put, they don't look at the similar situation. And of course, for sure, for sure, we're not calling for re-evaluating Islam like some of the Mubtadi are doing now. Yeah, we need to look at Islam again in a modern light. La. You need to look at your intelligence in a modern light. This is not <laughs> intelligent. But sometimes, yeah, I'll give you an example. One time I was with the, uh, a friend of mine and we were watching a sheikh on YouTube in Arabic and the sheikh said, because Ibn Taymiyyah had a fatwa that two believers should not speak in the language of the kuffar. And two Muslims should not speak in the language of the kuffar. So he looked at me immediately, this brother looked at me, he said, you see, don't you ever speak to me in English again. I said, yeah, the sheikh didn't say you can't speak. He's like, what are you saying? You just heard him and now you're immediately. So, okay, we'll ask a sheikh that we both trust. We went to the sheikh and the sheikh said, yes, Ibn Taymiyyah had a fatwa like that. But you look at why he gave the fatwa and see if it applies today or not. So he's talking about a time where Islam was the dominant religion the strong, and, and the strongest force on earth. And Arabic was the dominant language. His argument was, and why would two people, two Muslims, two Arab Muslims specifically, yani, at that time, who live in, and when Islam is dominant in the world, has the upper hand, and Arabic is a dominant language, speak the language of an enemy that they're at war with. Do you see how weird it is now? Yani, why would you speak the language of the enemy that you're at war with? You love them or there's some issue. What's wrong with your heart? That's what he was talking about. Does that mean you can't speak English? For a lot of us, that's the common language now. Unless you want me to bust out some Urdu. <laughs> and you're laughing like I don't know Urdu, huh? You sure? <laughs> and that's about the one of the four sentences that I can say in Urdu. <laughs> All right. Barakallahu feekum for being an attentive audience. I apologize if I went longer. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.